بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد continue on in our study of شرع السنة by إمام البابهاري رحمه الله رحمة العالي we already discussed from some of the explanations of some of the ulama of Ahl Sunnah in this time the explanation of Imam Babahari's statement where he said uh, from the Sunnah is clinging to the Jama'ah uh, from the Sunnah is clinging to the Jama'ah whoever desires other than the Jama'ah and departs from it then he is thrown off the yoke of Islam from his neck and he is astray leading others astray and we mentioned some of the ahadith of the Prophet والسلام, like the hadith, hadith of iftiraq, uh, that the ummah would split into 73 sects and all of them in the fire except one. And the Prophet والسلام, uh, was asked, Who are they, Ya Rasulullah? And the Prophet والسلام, said, Those who, meaning those who are saved, the saved sect, those who are upon what I'm upon and what my companions are upon. And Shaykh Ahmed al-Najmi, he mentioned some of the uh, benefits. He said, you know, that there's evidence from the Qur'an and the Sunnah and the Ijma of the Salaf regarding the importance of uh, adhering to the main Jama'ah and that the, as evidence for the following the Prophet وسلم, in his Sunnah. Uh, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi kitab al-Kareem, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُوا الرَّسُولَ وَأُولَى الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ Allah Tabarak wa ta'ala says in Kitab al-Kareem O you who believe, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those in authority over you. So when obedience to the authority is connected to obedience to Him meaning obedience to Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as long as it does not entail sinfulness meaning that the authority is not uh, calling you to do something sinful that illustrates the obligation to be obedient to them and prohibition of rebelling against them and prohibition of opposing them or rising up against them so the sheikh here rahmatullahi was negating uh, all these basically what has come to be known as and this was before of course this time uh, when he explained this treatise uh, negating the, the Arab Spring, what has been known as the Arab Spring and has been the several revolutions in uh, Arab countries, or in fact, mostly not revolutions, but mostly the overthrowing of the rulership because a revolution uh, in political science terms refers to that which uh, overthrows the system and a new system is in place. But in fact what you find from these uh, recent happenings is you find there's been a displacement of the leaders that were in power with new regimes that were either uh, as bad if not worse and sometimes a part of the old regime like what we see in Egypt happening. And then there's usually a backlash. So the, the implication from these rebellions, and this is what the Sheikh is referring to, and what the Salaf used to mention, statements from Hassan al-Basri, uh, Rahmatullah al in reference to the evil that, and harm that comes about from rebelling against the leader. That usually, almost always, you will not find good from these situations, unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees that there is some good or some unintended side effects from our part that we, we couldn't have uh, speculated that might have come about as a benefit from that. But overwhelmingly there is harm and this is why Ahl Sunnah holds it as a Qaeda that if the leader is a Muslim authority, even if they uh, have many, you know, that they're, they're wicked, they're wicked authority and they're oppressive, that you do not rebel against them. This is a qaida. This is a principle from the usul of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. It's an asl from the usul. It is a foundation from amongst the general foundation 
of Ahlul Sunnah Wal Jama'ah that we do not believe in rebellion and we do not believe in uh, revolution and so forth. And that if a situation in which the leader has clear, open disbelief and that we have, uh, that it is clear from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, Allah has given us clear proof that this person has left the fold of Islam, then even with that, there are conditions as the ulama of Ahl Sunnah have stated out, have laid out qadimin wa hadithin, you know, in the past up until now, that these are kawai, these are not something new from a group of scholars, or as some people want to claim that it's the scholars of Saudi or the scholars here and the scholars there. But in fact, these are kawa'id from Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, Qadimin, before Imam Ahmed even. Before, you know, those great Imams of uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam uh, Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmed, Rahimahumullah Jami'in. These Imams referred to these principles as well of not rebelling against the Muslim authority. Ever since the advent of the Khawarij, it became an issue. And so the Imams of Ahl Sunnah, in looking at the Nasus, looking at the text of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and the Salaf of this Ummah, and realizing the facade of uh, participating in rebelling or urging people to go against the Muslim authority or what have you, that there's mainly sharp, mainly evil that results from this. So this is uh, what uh, Sheikh uh, Ahmed al-Najmi was making a, a point uh, about. That it is a, as he said, he said, prohibition of rebelling against them and prohibition of opposing them or rising up against them. That there is the prohibition of these things and there's an obligation, the ayat that we mentioned, is it illustrates the obligation to be obedient to the Muslim authority as long as they don't call you to disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in addition to that, a very important thing that we have to understand that text by is also that the ulama of Ahl Sunnah, that with regards to when the Imam is doing uh, sinfulness or calling you to wickedness, this does not negate ta'a mutlaq. Ta'a mutlaq. This does not negate, and does not, uh, it does not negate the fact that you still have to be obedient to him. Not obedient in the thing that he did that was sinful. That, no. But that doesn't negate all the other good or all the other things that he commands that are in agreement with the Sharia, in agreement with the commands of the law and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. So, for example, if you have a country and the country has mukhalafat. They have many things which go against the Sharia. They're a Muslim authority. That doesn't mean you say, well, the leader is not uh, ruling by the Book of Allah in totality, or very little is ruling uh, of his rulership is, is by the Book of Allah, so we're going to rebel against him. No. And if he orders you, for example, he says riba, or uh, taking interest is lawful, and I want everyone to take riba. You must take riba. Well, you don't obey him in that. But that doesn't negate the fact that uh, the other laws that he is implementing, that you don't obey him in those other laws, which are in accordance with the Sharia. So it doesn't negate all uh, obedience to him. This is very, very important. Because as the Prophet ﷺ said, and we'll mention this when the time comes in an authentic hadith in Sahih Muslim, uh, where he said, Salawatu Rabbi wa salamu that if you see from the uh, Amir something, this is the paraphrase, that uh, or in, in the left of the hadith he said, Fi the umira bi ma'asiyatin fala sam'a wa la ta'a. That the Prophet والسلام, said that if the Amir, if the ruler, commands you with something which is uh, in disobedience to Allah, then there is no hearing and obeying. There is no hearing and obeying. The ulama of Ahl Sunnah say this means in that emr, in that command that the leader is commanding you to, to do that is sinful. The khawarij and the takfiriyin and those people who have deviated from the menhaj or methodology of Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah, they say no, that negates all obedience to them. So for them, the world, everything is black and white. Either you're a mu'min or either you're a, a, a disbeliever, basically. They don't have any in-between. They don't have any 
gradations. Instead, for them, everything is black and white, so they make tikfir, and they, uh, uh, if you, uh, if there's any sinfulness or or what have you, and they, uh, and they believe that the one who's on obedience, they have to be on a full obedience to Allah, that they cannot have any, uh, any sins that are any open sins, anything that is apparent. Uh, that they're doing, or especially the major sins. So, this differs with the creed of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Then, Sheikh Ahmed Rahmatullah mentioned, he said, This verse is clear, and there are verses which include that entire creed, like the statement of Allah, the Almighty, most gracious, hold all of you steadfast to the rope of Allah and do not divide. Allah says, Hold fast all of you to the, to the rope of Allah and do not divide. And like his statement, and like the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, this is my straight path. This is my straight path, so follow it. Do not follow other paths and split from uh, uh, his path. This is my command in order that you may attain taqwa. This is actually a different ayah. And this also illustrates the importance of following the straight path. The straight path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Surat al the, the path and the tariqah of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah, the path of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And do not follow other paths, do not divide and split from the path by rebelling. Uh, and this is my command in order that you may attain taqwa. By following Atiullah wa Atiyu Rasul, by following Allah and His Messenger alayhi salatu wa salam, this is how we can gain, we can gain taqwa. Because isn't everything in the Sharia based upon Kitab Allah wa Sunnah Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? That's the, the asal of everything. That's the foundation of Islam, of the religion of Islam. So that will also, aside from the nusus that mentioned that we will attain taqwa from, uh, from obedience to Allah and His Messenger alayhi salatu wa sallam and will uh, receive success لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ in order that you will be successful by being obedient and obedient uh, obeying the Messenger وسلم, that this is the Surat al Mustaqim and this is the path of the Mu'mineen and this will help you in your ibadah. Why? Because everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger وسلم, command to is good. And everything that they have that they warn us from is is evil and is something that's harmful for us as servants. So if we embrace what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has called us to as the, the the ulama state that taqwa, taqwa wa azza wa jal, is fi'l awamr Allah wa tark ma'asiyat Allah, wa kama qeel. That being obedient to Allah, uh, or, or, or taqwa, what does taqwa mean? One of the definitions of, in, with the salaf is that taqwa, God consciousness or fearfulness, is doing the commandments of Allah and avoiding His prohibitions. So that's how we can attain taqwa. So that means what? By practicing Islam or being obedient to Allah's commands, obedient to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, His commands, then we can attain taqwa. We can attain success. We can attain righteousness. And this can help us avoid falling into deviation to uh, following the path of those people uh, who deviated. And then the Shaykh mentioned, uh, he said, as for the evidence from the Sunnah, First, the hadith of Ibn Abbas, عنه, whoever sees from his leader something that he dislikes, then be patient. For whoever splits from the jama'ah by handspan, handspan dies the death of the days of ignorance. Also, the hadith uh, of Ubadah uh, Ubad ibn Samit, عنه, where he said, We took the pledge to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, to hear and obey during the times of ease and difficulty, and what we liked and what we detested and not to rebel against the leader unless we witness open, clear disbelief that Allah made clear. So very important, right there is, is, is the conditions for rebellion. Meaning that uh, the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala, they took the bay'ah, they took the Pledge of Allegiance to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not a secret bay'ah to a Khan al or this group or to their Sufi Shaykh or their Marid or what have you. But instead they took it to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to listen and obey during the times of ease and difficulty, uh, in what we like and what we detested. So even if they something went against 
how they, they felt about the issue. They took an oath of allegiance to the Prophet وسلم, to follow that command and not to rebel against the leader. Ah, there's the qa'idah, qa'idah of the sunnah. We don't rebel against the leader. Unless, illa, and yara kufra, kufra bu'aha. Unless we witness open, clear disbelief that Allah made clear, that Allah made manifest. So we, it is very, it shows us that Islam encourages us to avoid rebellion at all cost. Unless the leader has opened kufr, which ahle, this is that uh, the people, the, the ulama, the scholars, the people of knowledge have adjudicated that this imam or leader has left the fold of Islam. And then on top of that, then there's other conditions. You know, it, it, it goes back to the general qaida of Ahl Sunnah or the qaida in Islam that uh, we look at the maslaha wa, wa mafsada. When we look at the harms and weigh the harms and the benefit, is it going to require, is uh, by rebelling against a leader that has left the fold of Islam clearly, openly, and, and, and uh, disputes with Islam and so forth. Do, uh, is rebelling going to cause more harm to the community than benefit? Meaning massive bloodshed. Look at, look at Syria. Syria is a beautiful, beautiful example. And beautiful as in it illustrates the wickedness, but, be but not beautiful as in the sad, sadness and sorrow from the loss of life, the loss of property, the, the uh, damage to generations of human beings who are being destroyed by the wickedness of a, 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 a disbelieving ruler and a population that should have not rebelled against him in the first place because they did not have the ability to do so and uh, it became a very dangerous and out of control situation where blood is being spilled constantly. This illustrates for us the that looking, that principle of the ulama that these issues, as with all the issues in Islam, that they refer back to the fit principle of looking at the maslaha uh, wa mafsada of the issue, the harms and the benefits, weighing the harms and the benefits, which even uh, non-Muslims, uh, you know, consider those properties when they make policy to do whatever they do, or human beings in general, when they are thinking. They look at the harms and the benefits of doing an action. And then, Sheikh Ahmed al-Najmi, he mentioned the hadith of Hadaifa bin Yaman, uh, where Hudayfa uh, asked the Prophet والسلام, about the shar, about the evil, in order to avoid falling into evil. So Hudayfa, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, wanted to know about, uh, you know, the evil in order so that he would know what to be aware of, what to stay away from. And that hadith is alim, and it illustrates the importance of sticking to the jama'ah of the Muslims, and that they would be around, and that if they weren't around, that we should avoid his bia, we should avoid falling into groups and sects, avoid all of them. And adhere to the uh, a tree, uh, you know, as a, you know, and cling to your deen, and avoid uh, dividing. So that hadith is alim. Uh, Imam Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah taala, he said an explanation in Fat al Bari regarding this hadith in the narration of Aswad. There was an additional statement. So he said that in one of the narration of Aswad of the hadith of Hudayfa radiallahu ta'ala anhu that there was another uh, there was something additional and it was a statement hear and obey even if he takes your wealth and beats your back a malik so even if he uh, you should hear and obey the leader even if he takes your wealth so you're being oppressed and he beats your back he's physically beating you and that shows us the seriousness and what usually ends to be, uh, comes about as a result of rebelling. You know, these are prophetic 
this is prophetic guidance. This is from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, authentic ahadith, mentioning the importance of not obeying, uh, disobeying the leader and not rebelling against the leader. And in addition to that, this is these are kawaid from Ahl Sunnah. These are principles from Ahl Sunnah, and we see the result that when the people go against the, the authority, usually it is that authority, aside from the slaughter that usually takes place, that if the authority is removed, more often than not, uh, a worse authority is put in place. And this has uh, definitely been the sunnah in Islam, what we've seen, the way in, this, in Islam, and sunnah I mean by tariqah, or what we can see that is witnessed throughout history, that we see that uh, rebellion more often than not has caused, caused the spread of evil and wickedness. And even in history in general, you find that this is the case, that usually a massive loss of life and slaughter, and a lot of times the people who are oppressed, sometimes they get into power and they become the oppressor. They become just as wicked in oppression as those they replaced. So after that uh, narration and after the mentioning the ta'liq of Imam Ibn Hajar, Sheikh Ahmed al-Najmi, he mentions, he then clarifies the conditions for rebelling against the authority. He said, it is not permissible to rebel against the Imam that establishes the prayer. And unless he has clear, open, indisputable disbelief that is manifested by a law. And that indisputable disbelief, meaning the ulama, it's not a masail, uh which is, uh, has to do ijtihadi, you know, and that the ulama differ of whether that's disbelief or not. So it must be something that there's uh, an agreement because it, could you imagine how dangerous that would be if one alam makes a judgment and says, yes, this man has left the fold of Islam and another alam says, no, that is sinful, but he's not outside the fold of Islam and another one. And then the harm that would um, result from that and especially from those who follow that alam that has made takfir or the society that follows that ruling. So the danger of that, but instead, these are issues, and this relates to the issue of takfir, that when you uh, declare someone, uh, or when the scholars declare someone, or the judges declare someone to be a disbeliever, meaning that they've left the religion, it is not about something uh, it is not over an issue in which there's dispute of whether it's really disbelief or not. That, you know, uh, you know these are very serious uh, issues in Masail, Masail Daqiq and Masail Elmi that require the education of the uh, Muslim judges and the scholars of Islam. And that is not just for anyone to engage in that, and it should not be something uh, arbitrary. So it's a very serious judgment, and it's a very serious, it has very serious implications. Then the Sheikh said, also, it is not permissible unless the Muslim, Muslims possess strength, and this is what we said, to oppose that ruler. This is the creed of Ahl Sunnati Wal Jama'ah. This is what the Sheikh says. He says, this is the creed. This is a part of the foundation. This is Shara Sunnah. This is the creed of Ahl Sunnati Wal Jama'ah. These are what uh, many of these books of the early scholars, they, and these are early scholars, classical scholars from the Salaf of this Ummah that held these principles as uh, principles which united and formed the foundation of Ahlul Sunnati wa Jama'ah. Why? Because they're coming from Nasus, they're coming from the Kitab, uh, Kitab Allah wa Sunnati wa Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, uh, the Sheikh said, this is the creed of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah and those who follow the Athar have consensus that it is not permissible to rebel against the Muslim uh, ruler, regardless of whether he is oppressive or just, and some of the scholars have reported a total consensus on this. So this was the statement of Sheikh Ahmed al-Najmi, letting us know the importance of uh, not rebelling against the ruler, and that the Part of the, the main point here of mentioning the ruler with regards to obedience to the Prophet ﷺ and with regards to the Jama'ah 
is that by rebelling against the ruler, you have split it, you have split from the Jama'ah of the Muslims. You split from the main body of the Muslims because the main body of Muslims unite behind their ruler or rulers. And that when you call to rebellion, you call to you make takfir and you call to uh, going against them and cursing them and this and that and the other, then you are in fact splitting from the main body of Muslims, that you are uh, a narrow, a very small minority going against the main consensus of the Muslims, the main body of the Muslims. And this is very important as long as the Muslims are united upon the Haq, and if they're united upon a Muslim ruler, then it's not permissible, and this is a Qaeda from the Qawaii of Ahl Sunnah. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil, and we'll try to pick up our pace in this treatise and go to in the next uh, part, we'll talk about the companions being the foundation of the Jama'ah. Uh, and we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil.